Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for March 21st, 2023. Happy spring. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. We're back. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is the webcast and podcast that digs deep into the clutter that piles up between you and the life that you want to be living. We explore the habits and behaviors that lead to clutter, and we suggest strategies to slow the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we decide to keep. If you're new to our Zoom meeting, we want to let you know that you can share your comments and questions via the chat feature, and I'll try to make sure Gail gets to them before we move on to another topic. You can also use, use the raise hand feature if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question yourself via audio or video. We're also streaming the webcast live on Facebook, so you can share your question, questions and comments there, and I'll relay them to Gail. We're going to start by recapping the weekly tittle from oh so long ago, three weeks ago, we assigned you a weekly tittle called Buy Nothing Challenge. The assignment was to come up with a solution to one of your organizing challenges without spending any money if possible. We'd love to hear, hear from our participants in Zoom and Facebook who rose to that Buy Nothing Challenge. If you can remember, please share with <laughs> us in the comments. YouTube viewer Aroma of Hope, I like that name, Aroma of Hope had this suggestion to add to our list of inexpensive organizing solutions. An offbeat storage tub I occasionally picked up at work was the empty container from a store-bought store -bought birthday cake. Turn the clear bin, bin in quotation marks, upside down. You even get a lid. They aren't the most durable, but they're clear and can be a nice size for organizing socks, scarves, and such on a closet shelf, and free. I really love this idea. It was so clever. And as you say, it's not super durable. So you can't use it with anything that has any kind of weight to it because anything that's too heavy is going to punch through it. But it's perfect for lightweight, but voluminous things like the socks and the scarves you mentioned. So that was a great use of that container. And the lid keeps everything dust free. So great job seeing the free storage possibility in that object. And I'm sure that, you know, when one of them cracks, you can go find another one. <laughs> Great job. There's always going to be another birthday <laughs> if you right? work in a place where birthday cakes come, come in for everybody's birthday. Right. It should be a, should be a, an, an ongoing and steady supply, I would think. Mm. Bridget said, I bought nothing for weeks now, only groceries. Proud of myself. Ooh, good job. Congratulations. I saw a comment further up I need to scroll back to. Um, Jane gave a progress report and said, I made it through all nine boxes of paper and just have one consolidated box remaining to read. <laughs> that's not specific to the tittle, but that's some big progress. That is awesome, Jane. Congratulations. That must feel like the biggest win. I'm so proud of you. She said the rest was recycled and shredded. Awesome. Good job. And so... Those nine boxes are down to hardly anything at all. So that is fabulous. I'm super proud. Cheryl asked, what do you, what do, you do with textbooks no one will accept? Mm, so textbooks material gets dated and that's part of it. Like um, when a school isn't using that textbook anymore, then it, nobody at the school wants it because they want the one that the teacher is recommending. So you do have to um, uh, send them out for, recycling or you can donate them to if like if the Houston Public Library here accepts books and then they resell them um, you can try better world books sometimes people like to collect them so you can make them available through the better world books uh, that's a website betterworldbooks.com and they have physical drop boxes sitting around in you know random parking lots in in the United States and so if you go to the website you can see if there's a box near you where you can drop things off. Um, but generally, they're most likely the material is going to be dated enough that they're going to consider it um, uh, ready to be recycled. And so if you put it into a library system or something like that, or any kind of a, a book collection uh, situation like Better World Books or something else like it, then they're going to go through the process. If you took it to half price books, for instance, right now, they would accept it they wouldn't pay you anything for it they would put it through the recycle process so um you can just put it into a system that goes through the process of um, recycling them Kara reports i found a decorative tray that i had 
Gail saying inbox made me think of it. And I use use it to collect the books and notebooks I'm currently into, reading glasses ah. and a pen. Easy to scoop up and move and also keeps things corralled. And it's like a, it's like you're, a, you know, reading book project collection. That's great. Yeah. I love it. Your reading and writing station. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really great. Good adaptation. Uh, M reports. You weren't using otherwise. Uh, M reports ha have been working on cleaning the refrigerator. That's something that's, you know, that's it. It seems like it was just a minute ago that I did a huge fridge purge and reported on it. And it's time to do it again. How does that happen <laughs> so fast? You put a lot of food through that fridge. That's why. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, <laughs> Darby says, I'm currently cleaning out the office and playroom as they are getting painted at the end of the month. Ooh. Lots to go through. Papers, toys, trash. Yeah, and it's going to feel like so, like, refreshing the paint and also refreshing the contents will really feel like you did something special and fabulous in that room. It's going to be a great, um, it's a great ancillary project to getting it painted and using the painting as a trigger to make you go through the stuff is great motivation. Good job. A couple of suggestions from the audience on on about textbooks. Renee said, old textbooks, there are places online which may buy them. And I guess that's the better world books that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, M mentions homes, mentioned homeschooler might use textbooks. Yeah, depending, depending on, on how on old what, they are. You know, well, and what level we're talking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and Marcy said, crafters use old books sometimes. Offer them up on buy no, on your buy nothing group. Yeah, and because then they make altered books out of them. So they go in and fold the pages and cut holes out of them and decorate them. And, you know, it becomes it becomes a, a background for artwork, basically. Um, and Connie mentions point. Connie mentions some libraries donate to prisons. So that's mm. another uh, another place for it to go. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you know, anybody that handles a large volume of books is going to have a system of um, recycling, reusing stuff. And so. Um, just find your find your vehicle. And Susie mentions the little free libraries that you see sitting around. <laughs> now nobody's. I don't, there's not going to be a great interest in textbooks, like <laughs> in, a, in, a, in the little library. Yeah. In the little libraries, but mm -hmm. um, okay, we have a lot to talk about. We have we probably wrote more than we we will even have time to say today, and so we better get to it. Okay, we're going to start with uh, talking about big organizing projects. They, they can disrupt your routines and leave you feeling swamped and overwhelmed. So Gail's going to offer some tips to help you break down and keep control of big projects. Thank you to Roz for this topic. Um, Roz suggested we talk about how to plan a project so you can cut it up into logical bite-sized pieces and how to deal with a project at stopping points so that it doesn't impede your life. So that was her request. It's a very important part of any big project, figuring out what the bite-sized pieces are so that you can work in reasonable work sessions. So let's start by talking about the, the survey results around this. Weeks ago, <laughs> we asked our audience to describe the largest long-term organizing project on which you're currently working. And Terry had this to say, um, downsizing all of my collectibles. This has been an ongoing project for me for many years now. I actively do it for a while, and then I go a very long time with doing nothing. I started off with probably 30 different things that I collected and have that problem of feeling like they're all worth something or should be. I've gone through the trouble and had many yard sales. She goes on to describe some of the other methods she used to uh, downsize her collection. And uh, collectibles can take some work to manage. And, and if you think about it, it, it took you a whole bunch of time and effort to collect them all. So it's gonna take you some time and effort to uncollect it as well. <laughs> After you spent time and money on them, it's hard to make those decisions to let things go. But remind yourself that the overall goal now is to thin the collection. Your new goal isn't to collect, but to reduce the volume of what you own and manage. So however you accomplish this reduction is getting you where you want to go. If it doesn't translate into getting money back out of things, that's okay, as that's not the primary goal now. It occurs to me, too, that um, you know one, one focus you can put on collections is um, not... I'm making my collection smaller, but I'm making my collection better. Right. I'm removing the More. things that don't interest me as much. Um, I'm 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 keeping the highest quality items, the highest value items, the most beautiful items, 
the fresh because you know, you know. When, you, when you start collecting you're new at it and you might get some things that fit the parameters of the of the collection at the start and just aren't great examples anymore so and so and um, those are the first ones off the top to get rid of right yeah the ones that um you know, started you started with i've caught your cough now oh sorry <laughs> through the airwaves um suzanne wrote i would really like to paint the walls and change the flooring in my home so my long-term organizing project involves decluttering the unwanted the unloved and the useless i don't want to organize my clutter i want to have to pack and move a lot less which is an excellent plan let me just say that right off the bat to paint and redo the floors means you basically have to move out. So the less you have to manage for that temporary move, the better. Anything you can clear out for good is one less thing to pack and unpack. Uh, my friend Karen had to redo the floors uh, in her, her whole house after she had a major foundation repair. And uh, they had to rent a pod to put on the driveway. And um, they put things in there and they filled up their garage completely with their home contents in order to get it done. And it was a total cookie toss of their whole house. And so anything that you can take out the, so that's less to deal with is definitely the goal here. And it, that's the win when you thin that content collection of stuff that you have to move around in order for them to touch all of your floors. I mean, if you think about it, they had to go in all the closets. They had to go in under the laundry room. They had to move the washing machine, the dryer, like everything in her house had to be moved at least. And some of it, most of it had to be moved out in order for them to do their job. And so it's a huge thing to try to uh, redo your floors and the less you have to manage the better. So good job starting on that now. Um, Summer shared the current project is weeding through sentimental items and boxes of photographs left over after cleaning out my mom's 4,000 square foot lifetime uh, home. The top priority is to clutter, but it's so difficult. Yeah. Okay. So everybody has that cache of photos that they got from their parents. They're like, well, these are my parents' photos, but <laughs> you, know, you don't care about them enough, right? It's, it's always hard to get into them. So um, I will tell you that the best way to deal with photographs is to make several passes. And the first pass is to look for the easy toss things. If the photograph is blurry, if you don't know the physical place, if it's a landscape that doesn't mean anything to you, um, in the era, there's a, there was an era when every double, time you went to get photographs, you got duplicates, double prints, yeah, right. Or and then there was a minute where they decided triple prints was a good idea, <laughs> and so you can thin the population just by getting rid of the duplicates and reduce the volume by half immediately without any thought. Like, oh, there's two copies of this, I can throw one away immediately. So. If you're comfortable, then um, you can toss out people who you don't know, uh, the people that you don't know that aren't family. Um, uh, there might be photos of people at work or at church or school. Random people in random environments are likely easier to throw out and make that pass where the decisions are easier first. And that will really reduce the volume. And then you can go back and make some more discerning decisions about what has family significance, these are family members. I know these are family members, but I don't recognize them, but I need to ask my cousins or whatever who these people are. And so um, you can get down to the ones that might be more valuable to the family, might be more important to you um, by making that first pass through uh, to reduce the volume. Photos, and, photos are such a great illustration of the value of that initial keep toss pass mm -hmm. because they're an exhausting project. You have to, you have to if you, if you're trying, if you tr sit down and try and think about every single photo, if you just try and do them one at a time in whatever sequence they come up, you're going to, you're going to burn you out explodes. after a hundred <laughs> or something. Whereas if you go through and look for, I don't even know what this is a picture of. <laughs> if you toss the ones that are obvious junk first, you can, really reduce the the decision fatigue the pain and suffering, that comes right? later yeah mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and and this is a perfect segue into the discussion about organizing bigger projects so let's talk about how you can plan that big organizing project starting off with this um any big project has a bunch of steps to it and so you want to make a list of what you think the steps of the project are and you know i was thinking about organizing and i was as i was writing this and so i thought okay so 
here's some steps to an organizing project. You're going to pull out the trash and recycling. You're going to sort the contents. You're going to clear off a surface. You're going to relocate what goes in another room. You're going to decide what to keep and donate. These are all steps of a project. Make the list of what you think the project steps are. And then go back and look at this list. You want to review this list and see, are each of these steps something that can be done in one work session? And for you, that work session might be, you can work for two or three hours. You can work for an afternoon, whatever. This is where you have to factor in your own work capacity, your own ability to stay focused on the project, um, your own energy level and physical capacity. So for each of these steps on your list, can you do it in a work session, whatever work session is for you? And if the answer is yes, then that means that you've made the list with steps that are each step is a work session itself and you're good to go. But if you can look at a step on the list and you know that that step is way more than one work session for you, then that means you're not done yet. That means you have to break that step down into more steps. And so that in and keep breaking it down until each step that you have listed is a work session's worth. And we, we write things on a to-do list like clean the kitchen. I'm giving you an example. Um, but that one item, uh, that one to-do item, clean the kitchen, is really a whole bunch of chores. You need to put away all the food that's out. You got to empty and load the dishwasher. You got to put away the clean dishes. You got to wipe the counter, cleave the stovetop, put away any appliances and supplies that you pulled out to cook with. You're going to sweep and mop the floor. And each of those can take some time depending on how backed up the kitchen is. And so this is an example of in your head, the project is clean the kitchen, but the steps for cleaning the kitchen are really varied and um, multifaceted. And so any project like that needs to be broken down into when you think clean the kitchen, what do you actually go and do? And each of those steps needs to be listed as one of your options. We do the same thing with organizing projects. We think organize the office, but that really means sort, shred, and file the papers, uncover, uncover the floor and the desktop, put up the books, corral your outstanding projects, make a to-do list, sort the office supplies. Like there's many, many steps involved to organizing the office. And so if you're writing down organizing the office and then freezing because it seems so big, it's because it is, because that really is a whole bunch more steps than that. So whatever you list as a project step first, ask if it can be done in one sitting, whatever that is for you, and then keep breaking that step down into more steps until each one is a work session by itself. And then when you start working, if you actually get it done faster than you thought, great. Like if you thought that doing step A was going to take you three hours and it only took you 90 minutes. Awesome. You just, you got some free time <laughs> after as a surprise. Or you can decide that because it only took you half the time, you can go on to step B and do another step instead. Um, whatever works. And you, you want to, as you go through this list that you've created, you want to work only for the work session that you can comfortably do. So if you can only comfortably work for 90 minutes, don't start a step that's going to take four hours. You want to do a piece that takes the 90 minutes that you can comfortably do. And then stop when that step's complete. You'll eventually get through all of them and it'll probably be faster than you originally predicted. It's likely that your, you know, your estimates about how much time things are going to take are going to be um, wildly off in the beginning. And, and you'll get more refined about how long things take as you get more practice and experience. But Ultimately, the starting point is, this is a step I think I can get done in one day and then put everything away and be ready to go on about my day or whatever else I'm going to do that week and then come back to it again the next time you're going to do work. And eventually you'll get through the project. Since we were on the topic of photos, uh, Paula shared there's a DIY photo organizing podcast I think, and she put that in quotation marks. So I'm assuming that's the title, DIY photo organizing. That uh, podcast that might be helpful for some people. The host discusses both digital and physical photographs. Excellent. And that's a good resource. We'll send send you send you to uh, look for that because neither one of us is is any expert on photography or the <laughs> method methodology of mm. 
preserving photos. Marcy mentions there's an ADHD video on making to-do lists that mentions breaking each task down into smaller ones. Um, and that's kind of at the heart of um, getting things done. The, the David Allen organizing method is to try and break things into discrete tasks and, and to make a clear distinction between tasks and projects. <laughs> so sometimes what we think of as one little job to get done is really just a, it's a smaller project with several steps that have to happen in a certain order, or at least this thing has to happen before that thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, breaking down your project into smaller pieces might also help reveal to you where, oh, there's a project in here too. And so this project, like, you know, you've bought a, a piece of furniture that's going to hold some of your files, but it has to be put together. So that's kind of a project un, unto itself because you've got to make the space for it. You've, you've got to make the space to work. <laughs> you've got to unpack it all, make sense of the, the, uh, those crazy Ikea directions. Right. And, put it all together it. and so on. And, and so that's why I think analyzing your project is useful for pulling those things out that, that should be another project. Samudra has a hand up. Contractors know that, and they use a thing called the Gantt chart to try to map right. out the time and, and place and who the how the the plumbers have to come before the roofers and things like that. Right, so, right. And you can you can download Gantt, Gantt charts and find them in you know office and stuff. And that's a you know uh, that's a super fancy project uh, management tool that uh, goes for really big projects and people use it in business environment all the time, like Samudra said. Um, but um, you don't also don't have to do anything that fancy. You're really uh, depending on what your project is. So if you're just trying to organize your photographs or you're just trying to clear off the buffet, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, you don't need something um, super elaborate. You're just trying to give yourself the idea of, what the discrete tasks are and you may not know them a hundred percent you may think that you know them and you may break them down and then when you get into the project you're going to figure out that oh there's also this thing to add to the list and oh i forgot about that and whatever it doesn't matter it doesn't have to be perfect before you get started it just has to be um a list that you can start working from um and working on until you figure out what else needs to go on it and you make some headway in your project. Jane, who's uh, on the home stretch of her of processing nine boxes of paper, said going through all those papers was exhausting. Mm. After each hour of sorting papers, it helped to take a shredding break. Breaking the shredding into smaller amounts also helped keep the shredder from overheating. Right. And shredding is mindless. You just have to stare and shove paper into the machine. Right. And so good for you for taking the mental break and recognizing that you needed it because um, papers are um, sorting paper is every piece of paper is a decision-making process and it does generate uh, decision fatigue really quickly. So good for you for figuring out a way to adapt and cope and make your way through it. Excellent. Okay. We should probably move on to our next topic. Okay. Almost everyone who struggles with clutter can point to paper as one of their challenges. So we're going to offer today a short primer on managing the paper that you've decided to keep. In preparation for this episode, we asked our audience to select one of several statements to describe your ongoing relationship with incoming paper. We we're delighted to learn that 37% of you sort and manage each day's mail as it comes in, and another 37% sort and mail, sort mail and other papers at least weekly. So Good for all y'all. That is awesome. <laughs> and you're staying ahead of the mess. 17% said they sort and manage mail and other papers occasionally. If that's working for you, great. But if things are slipping through the cracks, like bills that are getting paid late or incoming money that gets misplaced, you might consider tweaking your routine to handle the paper more regularly. 6% say they tend to let the paper pile up and then deal with it in a Herculean effort. And 4% say they let the paper, the mail and the paper build up indefinitely. 
So you guys are definitely in the danger zone. <laughs> we encourage you to cultivate a regular habit of processing paper because those piles are only going to get more overwhelming as time goes by, which I'm sure you know. Once you've done all the hard lifting of sorting all that paper and making those keep toss decisions, assuming that you get through the process that um, Jane, what's it? Did you tell me Jane? Jane working yeah. on? Mm -hmm. Then uh, you've got to arrange the keep paper some way and that you can maintain it and you can find things again. And this is where most clients get stuck or overwhelmed because the default is one file per one type of paper labeled with a proper name, usually um, like, the it'll have the company name, like the electric company's name or the bank's name, and it's filed alphabetically. So somehow alpha files are everyone's go-to solution. But once you have more than 20 files, you can't remember what you named something. And so you don't know where any file is in an alpha <laughs> arrangement. And then you have to look through all the files from front to back to find something. So this is always a fail pretty quickly. This is why we talk about bigger buckets for paper filing instead. If you can think of the categories of your life and make files for those bigger categories, the bigger buckets, then you can go to that bucket and find what you're looking for most of the time. So you can use alpha within a bucket if you just have to alphabetize something, but start with big buckets first. So let me give you some examples of buckets that an average person needs at home. Um, Everybody needs a home file. If you're in a home, whether it's a rental or you own it, you have things related to the house and the contents of the house. And so uh, one big bucket is the home. And if you own more than one home, then you need two home buckets, basically. Because <laughs> everything in this home is isolated to this home. Everything in the other home is isolated to that home. And so you want those things separate. Um, then within that home bucket, there's a couple of categories everybody has, like home repairs. So for all the work that gets done on the house and the vendors you want to use again, um, people tend to save those things so that they can go back to, we used this guy last time, let's use him again. Or we made these repairs, we want a history of what's been done on the house. And so a home repair file is a typical bucket that somebody needs, which is better than having the tile vendor file with the the tile guy's name on it in the alpha file that you will never remember the guy's name or the company name. And so you won't know what to go look for. But if you have a home repair pile file, it's all in there. Home contents is another file. Um, if you think of um, receipts and the papers for things that you buy and put in the house, artwork, appliances, furniture. Um, sometimes if you have a home inventory for insurance purposes, you can have a contents list, but generally um, I think of a home contents file as where to stash paperwork related to things that are in the house. You want to have a home insurance file. Everybody that owns a home or rents a home has um, home insurance or rental insurance. You have some kind of insurance related to the house. And so you don't want a file that says State Farm on it, but you can have a file that says home insurance because regardless of the company, you're always going to have home insurance. So that part is always true. So that's a, a home bucket and a couple of the files in the home bucket. A car bucket would be a good, everybody has a car. Most people have a car, let me restate. And so there's a couple of files in a car file that you want. You want car insurance, regardless of the company. If you have more than, you know, you and your spouse, and maybe if you have teenage kids, then maybe you've got you and your spouse and your kids all have cars. Everybody's got insurance. But if you have a car insurance file, then all of those insurances are in one place. You need a file for the purchase documents and you need a file that shows the repairs and maintenance you do on the car. And so the receipts for all the work that you get done can be in, in a um, file. So you don't have to remember that you went to the Firestone company to get that tire done and you went to the uh, dealership to get the part fixed and you went to the paint, you know, the body shop to get the scrap, the scrape on the car fixed. It's all in the car repair file. Medical, everybody needs a medical file that includes, uh, I mean, a medical bucket that includes a medical insurance file, a medical reports file. Uh, if you have a long history of surgeries in your life, then maybe you need a surgical history file. And <laughs> if you have any kind of chronic uh, ailments, 
depending on how much time, uh, how much of your life you spend in front of doctors, then maybe you need a file that shows sort of the history of the doctor's visits and things that you've been on. Everybody needs a work bucket, whether you're employed so that you are an employee of somebody and then there's paperwork in between you and the, your employer. Or if you own your own business, then you're going to need um, work-related buckets related to that business. In that work bucket, you might have your work contract. If you're employed, then you probably signed a bunch of paperwork. When you signed on, you may be under contract with someone. Um, the, the retirement benefits that they're offering you, there's going to be paperwork related to that. Work reviews, uh, if you get annual reviews or there's other kind of evaluation paperwork. And your CV, um, uh, curriculum vitae that shows your work history, um, your appearances out in the world, work product, articles that you've um, published, things like that. Um, that can be one of the places where you keep that sort of work memorabilia. It can be a file in your work bucket. Um, a financial bucket, everybody's got finances related to their life. And so uh, with a file for the banking statements, a file for the investment statements, files for credit card statements, um, and uh, other bill files like utilities or other services, um, you can have a selection of financial related files. That's a big bucket. And then everybody needs a tax bucket, right? There's always got to be a tax bucket. So you're going to have one file that has the tax returns themselves in it. And then you're going to have a tax support file for each year, um, one for the current year. So you can go put things that are tax support into it as the year goes by. And then you're going to have prior year's tax support that you use to make the returns. So these are bigger buckets that you can alphabetize within them. Like if you are, if you are in the car bucket and you want to have the purchase documents in, in, P and repairs and R and insurance and I, you can alphabetize them that way if you want. But um, generally, I'm asking you to shift away from alpha as your orientation to um, the category. What is the category that you're trying to mess with so that you're thinking about it in terms of categories? Well, and, and, also, and also to shift away from extreme granularity. Yes, yes. Because this year, when you look at this piece of paperwork from somebody, and then you, and you'll make a folder with an article name on it, and then next year you'll find another article and you'll want to save it, but you won't remember the similar article, and so you'll end up making another article file. Like I, I think of a client that I had a long time ago that had, re, she had file cabinets that went on forever, and she always wanted me to organize the files, but the truth was, um she would get beyond, you know, three or four drawers of file cabinet and within them, there would be the same types of files over and over and over again. She would recreate them because she wouldn't be able to find the ones that she had made before. And, and then she would have one piece of paper in a, in a file so that it was, it was the art of taking that one piece of paper that you wanted to keep covering it up with a file folder and putting a label on it to make it so that you could find it again, except that it was too granular um, for her to ever be able to find anything. And so she just kept duplicating the same files over and over and over again, which was a problem. It was, it made a huge organizing project for me. And, um, and it was a lot of um, duplication, trip, triplicate, four copies of the same kinds of stuff over and over again. So if, and if it made it hard to filter by date. Yeah. If you're really, really, really into granular files then you need to commit to a like a software program you know a, an application that in which you register every single thing you file and and assign it you know it gets assigned a number there are systems like that that will you know you you tell it i'm filing the the all state bill from february and it will tell you put this put put it in this section and then you can find it again later but it but that's a huge amount of work to do, right? Like that's a lot of um, processing to be done. I'm wanting you to think in terms of categories because I want it to be easy for you to come up with um, when you're trying to find something. You don't have to remember where everything is, but it, imagine if you're trying to figure out, okay, I need to know when my car insurance expires. So you know it's related to the car. So you know you're going to go into the car bucket and look at those car files and you're going to go look at car insurance. 
And then it doesn't, you don't have to remember the company name. You don't have to remember when the last time you paid something. Um, it doesn't matter because whatever's related to the car insurance is going to be in that car insurance file. So head to the car insurance file and find what you need without having to remember all of the granular detail. That's the most important thing. So does anybody have any questions about this bigger bucket concept? Um, Samudra said, I have no problem with clear categories. It's the overlaps that perplex me. And give me an to, example. Yeah, if you want to jump in Samudra with an example, uh, I, my, my default suggestion is write some things on the outsides of file folders. You know, if you think it could go in two categories, put it in one and then on that on the outside of that folder, put a post-it or, or write a note that you might also look for it in this other place or, or you know in the place where you didn't put it write a note about where you did put it well if you think um, about it you're gonna have to look for it anyway right there's there there's some amount of searching that's involved so if you have to decide between did i put it in category a or category b that just means there's two places for you to look you don't have to look through all of the files if it's not related to the house then you don't have to, or the taxes, that means you don't have to look at any of those files. If if you think it could be in car and it could be in something else, it's making the amount of files that you have to go through to guess to see where it is a smaller manageable population. So if you can't immediately go to something, just remember that it's still, instead of having, if you have a big alphabetized with proper names a file cabinet drawer full of files that start at A and go to Z, in order to find the file that you're talking about, you're going to have to go from the front to the back looking for it, looking at every single file folder. But if you have the categories set up, then you've subdivided those file folders. And um, if you have to look at more than one category, you're still not having to look at the front to the back, the 100% of the population. And so all you're really trying to do is is shorten the amount of time that you have to hunt um, and, and make it be logical and generic. The hunt is more generic so that you don't have to remember a, a vendor's name, a, a company name, a, a, any kind of a date period or anything like that. You can just go looking for a big generic. It's related to the car. I need to go look in the car files. And then you're looking at those four or five files and flipping through paperwork instead. Yes, ma'am. That's not quite what I'm asking. I have like three kinds of insurance, health, home, car. That's it, right? So okay. does the do I have an insurance folder or do it, does the home insurance go with the home stuff and the car insurance go with the car stuff and the health insurance go with the health stuff? So I would do oh, it the, the second way, yeah, because I think... Um, when you are dealing with health insurance, it's because you're having to deal with things related to your health and your medical and, you know, providers and what benefits are covered and whatever. And so um, it makes it, it, it makes sense for it to be there with all of your other medical related stuff. When you're dealing with the house insurance, it's because something's wrong with the house and you're going to have to file a claim and you're going to have to get repair people to come. And so the things related to the house are all together. And, you know, because, because when you're dealing with, Medical insurance, it almost 100% has nothing to do with your car insurance, your health insurance, I mean, your home insurance, and vice versa. When you're dealing with the car insurance, it has nothing to do with the other two. And so, um, yes, it's all insurance, but they wouldn't, you wouldn't have to consult your home insurance and your medical insurance at the same time, most of the time. Gotcha. And so, does that make sense? Yes. Yes. I'm just trying to be, um, I'm trying to, um, create categories that are logical in terms of how you would use them and need also, to retrieve they're, data. They're good. They're size relative too. Yes. Because the only thing I use my renter's insurance for is once a year, I have to pay the, pay the bill, you know? Right, right. Exactly. Right. And then you're done, right? In case there's an earthquake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if something really goes wrong, somebody breaks in the house and, you know, then that's the whole point of having the insurance. But the idea is you have the insurance and you hope that the event that you're insuring against never takes place. And so, if all is well, you pay the insurance, you file it, and you're done with it. For the year. It's, it's in a sit there category. The health insurance is in a deal with it all the time category. And the car right. insurance is somewhere in between since I, it's auto pay. Exactly. So like right now, it's in the shop. The car is in the shop, so I'm right. glad I have it. So 
Yeah. It has, to, it has to have a current file and a light and a medium light file and an ancient file, and I don't know when to throw them away. No. <laughs> I would like I would like a list of where to draw lines. And I'm figuring out what kind of container works for what kind of issue paper. Right. I'll tell you right, some right. other time. But I need a list of where to draw the cutoff for how long to keep stuff. Thank you. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Samudra. We have talked about that a few times, so there's probably some um, some of the other shows that cover some of that, but we, can, we well, can always discuss it again. I think the most important ones to keep in mind are there are a few things that people are inclined to save that have really little or no <clears throat> practical value after a certain time period has passed. You know, unless you unless you were taking a home office deduction, what you don't need your utility bills after the payments have been posted to them and mm -hmm. you know every six months they send you a new car insurance uh policy right and all previous ones are now out of date and yeah and expired no policies apply. And don't work so you can throw those and those are usually a huge heap of paper too that's uh -huh. you know, 15 pages or something um jane mentioned when a paper could go in taxes or elsewhere i always file in taxes my thinking is which file would I most likely look in or need it for? Right. And if you're going to use it as a, if you're collecting paperwork for deductions or you're proving income that way, then having it in the tax support file, um, you're going to have to go and pull it into the tax support file at the end of the year. Anyway, you might as well put it in while you know it's there and you know what it is. I think that's perfectly reasonable. M, M asked, is there a list of no brain, no brainer throwaway paperwork other than junk mail and old newspapers and magazines? Paid bills, I presume, but just recently I had to prove that I'd paid and on another needed quick reference on what was charged the last time. We that's that's something we should probably work on. Put together a well, list. Well, and, and we do have that um shortcut list that gets handed out when people subscribe. Yeah. Oh, okay. That, has a, that list. We are quickly running out of time, so we had better get to our third topic. Okay. Our next topic was suggested by Cynthia in response to one of our surveys. Cynthia wanted to know our thoughts on keeping things just because they have always been there your whole life, and you think they're just a part of your landscape. <laughs> so <laughs> That's so funny. Let's go back to our survey. We asked our audience to describe something in your space that more objective eyes might see as clutter, but that had become part of the landscape for you. AG said, some things that needed to be moved off the living room table in a hurry for guests were all set on the bookshelves, which are otherwise actually quite tidy, and they just live there now. And you gave a perfect example of what I'm going to talk about in a minute. A quick solution to manage a problem never gets looked at again, and then it becomes a permanent uh, Lenny said, my guest room is also a storage room with two eight foot by two foot tables stacked on top of each other against a wall. On them and under is all my unsold art. If I could get rid of them, that room would be much more welcoming. It also weighs on me not to have any more room to make more art. So I've stopped. I'm really sorry you've stopped making art. That's no fun for you. Um, it's time to figure out a way to get to give some of it away. Can you list some of the pieces on next door, or free to a good home, or charge a small amount? Uh, let some of them go to another person. Offer to friends, any charity that you support. And don't get your feelings hurt if they don't jump on it. You're just searching for the person who wants some. So concentrate on clearing out some space so that you can make some more art. Uh, Diana shared, uh, we have a buffet that is a room divider between our kitchen and our living room whose flat top just collects stuff from us walking in the door. On the buffet is stuff I have to deal with from emptying my mom's condo, cookbooks, and our recent purchases. It would be more peaceful if it was clear, but it's a magnet for stuff. So recognizing the magnet status is really important. Um, I'd see if this is one of those things that could be changed in the landscape to get it out of there. Uh, thinking of that surface as burning hot and nothing gets to stay there for more than a hot minute might spur you to finish the onboarding action you need to do to get the things all the way into the house. Uh, the mom's condo stuff is definitely an unfinished chore that needs your attention ASAP. It's a one and done project for sure. So time to get it out and deal with it. So let's talk about that stuff that's sitting on the buffet in Diane's house. It's a perfect example. 
um, we park stuff to get it out of the way during the move, like when we're moving in, before a party, before a guest comes, or when we come home from the day. We get busy and we leave stuff there. Or maybe we think about it and we design the furniture layout when we move in to a new place and we gradually add other pieces in over the years, slowly, slowly filling up the space. So visually, the longer it stays there, the more we get used to it. We expect it to be there. We remember it there. We learn to walk around it there. It becomes normal and familiar for it to be there. And we can no longer imagine it not being there. Now it feels like it's permanently installed there and glued in place and can't be removed without monumental effort. It's become part of the landscape. And we vaguely notice it, but we always expect it to be there. So I'm going to say to you, change is hard, <laughs> but none of that stuff is permanent. It's time to put on your x-ray vision today goggles so that we can see that stuff again. Is that big cabinet in the corner really necessary now? Does it make sense there or could it be somewhere else in the house? Is the overall volume of things bigger than my actual home space? What got added over time just doesn't really belong here after all, maybe. What did I inherit that just doesn't work for my family? What worked for 30 years? What things that actually have worked for the past 30 years, but don't work for what's happening in my life now? Does this item or furniture or artwork or clothing, et cetera, reflect who I am and what I'm doing right now? You all talked about that with Ed last week as he was telling the story of us working together in his house, telling him that a piece of memorabilia was not who he is now allowed him to edit it from his belongings. And you can use that as a screening process to see everything in the house through that those goggles. It may have been there for 20 years and you may be used to it being in the landscape, but that doesn't mean it can't be moved. It's just stuff, it's just furniture and it can be shifted around. People that like to decorate find this process entertaining and fun. They love stripping apart, re-envisioning, rebuilding a space. The rest of us, not so much. <laughs> it just seems like a lot of work. But <clears throat> when it's become part of the landscape, it's time to actively get out those goggles and look at something with fresh eyes and go, I know it's been over there in the corner for forever. I know those things have been on the bookshelf for forever, but do I really want them to live there forever? Or was that just a chore that I didn't complete? Was that just a project that I never circled back on? Was that an impulsive action to cope with a situation that I never circled back to clean up? And um, recognizing that there's a project there and going about treating it like a project, making the steps of uh, things that you need to get done. And, and Diane's list of things that was on the buffet, the one that jumped out at me the most was, these are the things that came from clearing out my mother's condo. So what that says to me is her mother was moving out or had passed away and she had to empty the condo and she was probably doing it under duress and in a lot of hurry. And she was making a whole bunch of decisions that were hard. She did a lot of work to empty the house. And so the things that came home that she wanted to keep at the time um, were probably things that were sentimental to her or that reminded her of her mother, or they were the things that she thought were useful that she would incorporate in her own house. And so she sort of made those choice, uh, those choices in the moment under duress. And then they came house, they came home and she got him out of the car and sat him on the buffet and was like, Oh my God, thank God that chore is done. That was so hard. I'm so exhausted. And she did not want to think about it for another hot minute. And so it went onto the buffet and it's never come off. So there was a final step to the clearing out of mom's condo, which is to incorporate the things that she decided to keep. And she never executed that task. So now she gets to go and do it. And hopefully she's had an, a little bit of time to recover from the project, the original project of cleaning out her mother's condo. And she's got some fresh energy to go and look at the stuff. And maybe emotionally, there's some challenges there about, I don't want to face my mother's stuff again it's going to make me sad or it's going to make me cry or whatever. Um, or maybe it's just that, oh God, there's more work related to my mom's condo. And I don't want to think about it. Well, yeah, but you also don't want your buffet to be covered with those boxes of stuff. So 
time to um, make a project out of it, pull it out and start processing it. And if there's been a long time since you've done it, um, you may find that there's things in there that you don't actually want anymore. Under the duress of emptying your mother's condo, you sort of erred on the side of caution and kept a lot of stuff that maybe now you can go, yeah, I don't really want that. I don't really want all this stuff. I really want one of these. I don't want seven. And so you can um, expect to filter it with some additional donations to be made. And then um, also find the things that you wanted to keep and go put things in your keepsake box, go put things in your kitchen that you brought home, go hang up that piece of clothing that you wanted to keep and wear, whatever, um, whatever you brought home from the condo for yourself. Maybe it's just, you know, it's a box of goodwill that needs to be donated and you just never got that far. Um, now's the time. And that's an easy one because you're not going to be bringing in a new box of things from mom's condo every week. This is a one and done. Once you're done, that space is clear 100%. And so um, unlike the process of I go shopping, I come home, I, I put things on the counter at the end of the day, I put things on the buffet at the end of the day, and that happens because I come in every night. That's an ongoing process that you have to work on to uh, update um, how how you get to the end of incorporating all those things into the house. But the condo process, the, the condo box is a one and done. And so that's a good way to get a bunch of space that stays clear for a while. I would also say that if those things are a, an ongoing process for you that you have to get into over and over again, then having a conversation with everybody that contributes to the pile, having that conversation with you know, your spouse, your kids, everybody that comes and dumps stuff on, um, you know, setting the example for this isn't the end of the project today, that we have to take this stuff from here on to the rest of the house and go put it away and enforcing that rule for yourself and for others um, is how you keep the buffet clear. The end. Okay, we are about out of time. Um, <clears throat> I want to remind our viewers that we'll be back next week, March 28th. And for our EU and UK uh, audience members, we'll be back in sync at the usual time, not the not the earlier time of uh, this time of year. Yay! Thanks for keeping up with us. We have not uh, we have not identified our topic for next week week, so watch your email for an announcement of that in the next day or so. Uh, Gail, you want to give us the tittle? Yes, the tittle is called "Break It Down." This week's assignment is to make or refine your plan for managing a big long-term decluttering or organizing project. Write down the key objectives of your project. For example, I will empty all the unopened boxes from the last move, or I will make the home office usable again, and then make a list of project steps. Don't worry too much about putting them in the right order, but do make note of any step that has to happen before in, uh, another task can be done. Review the project steps, and for each one, Estimate how much time you think you'll need to handle it. And if any step seems like more work than you can handle in one work session, one of your work sessions, then break it down farther. You're aiming for defining the project components that can each be completed in one session. And then schedule a few work sessions and put your plan into play. Revisit your plan as needed as you go along. You can revise it. You can add steps to it as you realize there's more steps. You can break them down farther if it turns out that something's taking too long. Um, do your best and then get started and revise and, and keep going. And we will look forward to hearing from you. If you're watching this on YouTube, we would love for you to join us live. To get notifications about upcoming events, we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook or join our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We love to hear from you, so please send us your questions, comments, and topic suggestions on YouTube, Facebook, or anywhere else that you find us. You can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today, and uh, thank you so much for all the great lovely well wishes that I got while I was sick. Um, the pond just, you know, kicked me to the curb and left me hacking and wheezing on the couch. And I just couldn't um, talk and have a conversation with you like this for an hour and uh, not 
cough my head off. So thanks to Ed for punting so well last week. He had a great discussion with the group last week, and I appreciate that you did that. And it sounds like the first week that I was gone, you guys had a lot of conversation um, amongst yourselves, which is really great. So thanks for holding the space for me. We really appreciate it. And I'm so glad to be back. I miss you guys. And uh, we'll be back next week. We'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye.